Good evening, welcome to uh, Explore Wycliffe Live. And I'm very excited tonight to be able to hear or to learn more about sign language Bible translation. My name is Wendy Johnson and my husband Morris and I host, usually host um, the evenings. Uh, but tonight I'm gonna turn it right over to the director of our global sign language team, Terry Chapman. Um, she's the, she said Zoom GSLT. <laughs> Go ahead, Terry. That's green, okay. And that reminded me is if you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll take um, breaks during the presentation, Dan and Carolyn, if that's okay with you, I can maybe break in and say, have a question. And then um, there's a few of us that are willing to stay longer after the, this hour is up for anyone that wants to ask further questions. Okay, Terry. Okay, and I just want to thank you again publicly, Katie. I'll let you sign for me. It's easier. You're pinned big. Um, yeah, uh, just thank you for the last minute taking that on. It, we had it all set up and arranged and best laid plans. Oh, well. Um, I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. As Wendy said, I'm the director of the Global Sign Languages team, and Dan and Carolyn work on that team. They are our stars of the show tonight, so I don't want to take too much time. What we wanted to do to start with is to show you a video that Wycliffe US made about a year ago. The video is about the Thai sign language translation projects, but it could apply to any sign language translation project, any deaf community around the world. Um, it does have closed cap, or it has subtitles, captioning, so we don't have to worry about interpreting that. We can just show the video. It, the sound should come through clear as I do that. So let me show that, and then once I've done that, I am going to turn it over to Dan and Kim. People assume that since you're deaf, you can see, so you can read. They hand them a Bible, they can look at it, they can see it, they can read it. But what people don't realize is this is not their language. Basically, deaf people can read the words, but, but putting them all together and actually grasping the meaning are two different things. So if you can't grasp the meaning, you can't really drill down and get a deep understanding of the love of God, the grace, the truth. And there's just so many things about God that you can't really grasp because it's not in your language.
having a Bible that everybody can understand, it levels the playing field. It doesn't matter if you've been in the church for you know, 50 years or 50 days. You can look at it, you can understand it, and it, it, everything changes when people can actually understand what they're looking at. My dream is the Thai deaf community seeing a Bible in their own language and saying, wow, somebody took the time to do this. And as they then watch the scripture, watch Jesus, watch the disciples, watch Paul, that life of Christ is going to, it's going to change the community. Translating the Bible is, is a lot of work, but at the end of the day, that's not what we're really about. It's not Bible translation, it's Bible transformation in people's lives. And that's, the Bible is just how the life of Christ gets to people. It's the life of Christ in the community that just turns everything upside down, inside out, and makes everything new. That's what we're looking for. I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Carolyn. Dan okay, so, and Carolyn, it's all yours. <laughs> <clears throat> Perfect. Well, I'm Dan, and this is my wife, Carolyn. Our assigned names to maybe make your life a little bit easier. I'm a D and a cross on the shoulder, and Carolyn. So those are our assigned names. It's our English name. Interpreters names. disappeared, at least on my screen. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I can... I was, I can scroll down, I have a sidebar, and I can scroll down and I can find Katie again. Yes, go ahead. Okay, if, as long as Angela can see, we're good. This is Katie, Angela said she could see me just fine. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dan and Carolyn. Yep. Um, so we are members of Wycliffe Bible Translators, and we've been members for about three years now. And we work on the Global Sign Languages team. Um, and we just want to share our story with you tonight and tell you how the Lord called us into um, Bible translation, and tell you what that journey has been like, um, and you know what our experience on the Global Sign Language. Um, has been like. Um, so we're going to start and tell you what happened right before we went to the University of North Dakota the summer of 2015. 
So in, yeah, in, in 2015, we had been married for about a year and uh, we were praying for direction for our lives. I was working in childcare. Uh, I can't hear anything. I can hear you fine, Carol. Okay, okay. Um, and so, um, but we were feeling like God was calling us to something else, but we didn't have any idea what that was. Um, I did linguistics in college. And so as we were praying about it, we thought, well, maybe if we did some higher education in linguistics, maybe God will call us to something else. Um, but that was pretty much all we were going on when we went to North Dakota uh, last fall, or sorry, in, in 2015. So, uh, so we went to SIL UND. Um, did you want to explain that? Yeah. Um, so when we went to SIL UND, like Carolyn said, we were, I mean, ultimately um, pursuing a master's degree for her, um, and she was taking linguistic classes there. But really, the, the transformation that happened over that summer um, was very much a transformation um, for me. Um, I learned that summer that I had a very skewed view of missions, um, and I thought that, you know, missionaries were special people that, you know, are kind of over there, and they do their thing, and we send them money every once in a while. Um, but I learned that really, um, I mean, missionaries are just normal people, you know, and they're, you know, they're normal people, and they happen to be missionaries. Um, and just want to briefly say what SILUND is. Um, it's a um, graduate linguistic program at the University of North Dakota that happens each summer. Um, and they have a spoken language track and a sign language track. Um, and so often um, Bible translation organizations will send their missionaries to SILUND um, for the linguistic education. Um, so we were going just to see what God had in mind and maybe to pursue some um, higher education in linguistics. But uh, we weren't aware of, um, of what the culture was at UND and uh, how many different people from different missionary organizations were there. So this was, um, for Dan, a first opportunity for him to actually get to know missionaries for the mm -hmm. first time. Yeah. And there, I mean, there are lots of missionary families, you know, missionary couples, singles, um, and I was able to identify with real live missionaries um, and that broke down the wall that I had constructed, I mean, in my mind that separated me from missionaries. And I, I mean, began to identify with them. Um, and I realized that, you know, you know, missionaries are actually normal people. And, you know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe one day when we're retired, we could do missions. And throughout the summer, you know, God just worked in my heart. And eventually I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe we should, you know, maybe we're going to apply to Wycliffe before we retire. And then eventually God made it very clear that we were to apply to join Wycliffe now. Um, so, you know, I really began to see how the Lord was calling us into missions now and how he prepared, you know, he had been preparing me for that calling um, for quite some time. Yeah. And before we went, uh, we were looking at the website and, um, you know, I was getting ready to take classes and we saw that there was a sign language track, um, which really appealed to me, but I just dismissed it right away because I thought, well, probably I have to be deaf or I have to at least already know ASL or something. Clearly I'm not qualified at all. So I didn't even look into it because I assumed it wasn't even a possibility. Um, and so, when we got there, um, I had the opportunity in one of the classes to take Ethiopian Sign Language. Um, and so that was very exciting for me to, um, I had done little sign language classes before, but nothing, um, nothing very good. And so that was my first taste at really being able to see um, how sign language works and um, 
and I mean specifically Ethiopian sign language, the way that works. And um, and so um, through those classes, I was able to um, have this interest that I already had, um, and um, and just see how many um, how many different people were using that in so many different ways to serve the Lord. Um, and so, um, so while we were there, there's, um, a number of people who are working in sign languages. Many of them are deaf and we were able to build a relationship with a couple, um, who are working in sign language Bible translation. And they, uh, shared with us what the need is, um, and what they're doing. And, um, and we, especially Dan hadn't seen sign language before. And so he wanted to be able to talk with them. And so he just learned as much as he possibly could. Um, just, you know, little, little conversations, um, nothing very detailed, but um, to build a relationship with them. Um, and so, um, so that was kind of the first time for Dan to really see sign language and see, um, just the the wonderful things that is done with sign language um yeah the the doors that are opened um because of sign language um and i mean in addition to that you know everything carolyn just talked about the you know the learning that we did about deaf culture and sign languages um the classes that we took themselves have actually ended up being incredibly helpful um Carolyn, she took the first package of classes. It's called Package A. She took that in 2015. Um, we actually went back just this last summer, um, and I took those classes because we saw how valuable those classes were for Carolyn um, when we uh, were in Romania in 2017. Um, but to let you know, the classes that are in Package A, there's a course called Second Language Acquisition, and that class really focuses on just the process of acquiring a second language, both in theory and in practice. Um, this last summer, I got the opportunity to begin learning Dutch sign language, and Carolyn, as she said, learned Ethiopian sign language um, back in 2015. There's also a class, Syntax and Morphology, um, and that one you learn about the structure of language. And as we're now in Spanish school in Costa Rica, that's been incredibly helpful having a foundational understanding of just generally how the structure of language works. Um, there's been lots of times that in class or, you know, language learning sessions that we understand things a lot faster because we understand the kind of core of what goes into a language. Um, there's also phonetics class and they have both a spoken and a signed version of that class um, where you learn how to produce the sounds or hand shapes um, and also how to transcribe those. Um, and then lastly, there is a class that you take called sociolinguistics. And that one you kind of learn about the social implications um, of languages on a language community. So the, the I mean, the classes, um, like I said, they've just been incredibly helpful in both our adjustment to Romania in 2017 and now in Costa Rica um, here this year. So um, the thing that was helpful for us um, while at UND um, was that we got an opportunity to talk with people who are actively working on the field in linguistics, um, and it, it gave us an opportunity to get a picture of what that actually looks like um, and what their lives are like and their families and um, and that helped us in our, as we were praying and in our decision making, um, just to have people that we could sit down and talk with and say, okay, we're thinking about this. Um, what can you tell us and what do we need to be aware of? And um, for us, our biggest fear was, wow, we are so unqualified um, because we don't have any experience. And, um, and we were just very encouraged. Um, by all of those people that we were able to meet and talk with and um and we were really able to enjoy the classes and um it was a, a very very helpful positive experience for us 
So, um, so by the end of the summer, um, God had been, um, more specifically, I was, I was kind of easy to, uh, say, yeah, I'll sign up, but, um, Dan was not familiar with, um, missionaries or linguistics or Bible translation or deaf culture or sign language, anything, um, before that summer. And so it was all through that summer that was kind of rapid fire information that God, um, was teaching him. And so by the end of the summer, we were feeling very strongly that God was calling us into Bible translation. Um, and, uh, we, like I said, we were feeling, um, very unqualified to work in sign languages. Um, and we had the opportunity to talk with some people who are also working in sign language and, um, and they, they encouraged us just in that, no matter what language group we would go into, we would be need, needing to learn new languages and new cultures, um, new environments. And so the fact that we didn't have an understanding of deaf culture already or of sign language, um, the important thing was that we were able to be teachable um, and, and learn new things and not go into it thinking, oh, I know all about this already. So, um, so as we were praying, we felt like the Lord said, it's up to you. You can either work in spoken language or sign language. You know, it's your choice. Um, and ultimately, we felt like our decision was, okay, so do we want to use our ears or our eyes? And um, just knowing our preferences and the way that we think, and um, we would so much rather use our eyes than our ears. And so, um, and so we decided that we were going to make that commitment and say we're going to work in sign language. Um, and since then, we are so thankful. It was sort of a little bit of a blind decision, um, but we just, we love deaf culture and we love sign language and um, just the visual world. That's, um, that's right up our alley. We would rather be able to show somebody something than tell them about it, you know. So, um, yep. Yeah, so just sort of to recap a little bit, um, this all happened in the summer of 2015. Um, the beginning of the summer, it's not that I was opposed to being a missionary, it's just that the thought never even occurred to me. Um, and by the end of the summer, um, we were talking with the Wycliffe recruiter and, you know, asking questions, you know, wh where do we go from here? And we ended up um, applying to join Wycliffe Bible Translators um, at the end of the summer in 2015. Um, and we also began corresponding with the leader of the Global Sign Languages team. Um, they have an orientation and training program. So we started corresponding with the um, leader of that program, just beginning to ask questions, you know, what can we expect going forward and that sort of thing. Um, after we um, applied to join Wycliffe. That took a couple months to go through that process. And November of 2015, we um, were members of Wycliffe Bible Translators. And that winter, we did Equip, which is the first thing that you do as a missionary with Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, and um, the next major thing that we did- That's partnership developments. So yeah. Learning um, develop your partnership with churches and individuals mm -hmm. um, and your prayer network, um, which you have to have completed before you can go onto the field. Yeah, and that's a, there's an online component that you do, and then you go to Orlando, Florida for two weeks um, to work in person there. Um, and um, the next thing that we did is the intercultural communications course. Um, and what I want to highlight here is, um, so when you join Wycliffe, you need to do a quip. Um, and that's kind of like, I don't know, the major requirement that Wycliffe has you do, the major thing you have to do um, in addition to your partnership development. Um, but one really appealing thing about the Global Sign Languages team is that the only extra, you know, education, the only extra thing that you have to do before going on the field is this intercultural communications course. Um, four weeks. Yeah, which is four weeks in North Carolina. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about how this course has been helpful 
Um, but I just want to highlight the difference. We have some friends that work on other teams or with other organizations, and a lot of them spend years doing education, training, completing their master's degree before they can even, you know, begin to make plans to enter the field. Um, and the way the Global Sign Languages team is set up, um, you don't need to finish your master's degree before going on the field, um, which for me, that's really appealing. I think that's a really big bonus. Um, so we um, did the intercultural communications course. Um, that was the summer of 2016. Um, and then we finished raising our partnership development. Um, and then we were ready to move to Romania for the orientation and training program. Um, so, and the, the orientation and training program is sort of the first thing that we did as, um, you know, you know, members of the Global Sign Languages team. Um, Wendy, this is sort of a transition point. Um, do we have questions that we want to stop and ask, or should we keep going? There hasn't been any questions, so, but just a reminder, people can put it in the chat. Doing a great job. All right, so um, we'll, we'll keep going then. Um, so, uh, February of 2017 was a major transition for Carolyn and I. That is when we, you know, packed up in the States and we moved to Romania. Um, and, you know, we knew that we were going to be living in, you know, East Europe for about a year doing the orientation and training program um, for the Global Sign Languages team. Um, and that program, there are four main focuses, four main things that we were working on during that year. Um, so the first thing is language and culture learning. Um, so, and that's both spoken Romanian and Romanian sign language. Um, we're also learning self-care and thriving while living overseas. Um, we spent some time learning the um, structure and the organization of SIL and the Global Sign Languages team, because it's you know important to know about the team that you're on. Um, and then the other main thing is um, we spent a lot of time talking about our future role, what our future role with the team was going to be. Um, as I mentioned, there isn't any, you know, pre-field education that you need to do. You don't need to decide ahead of time what your job on the Global Sign Languages team will be. That's one of the things that you explore during that orientation in training program of what is your role going to be? How are you going to fit into the team? So, um, so for us, our experience in the orientation and training program, um, remember this was a first time experience for us um, in deaf culture and sign language. And so Romanian sign language is actually our first sign language. Um, we know little bits of, of ASL and we can understand pretty well, but producing it, we don't, we, um, we didn't know that ahead of time. So. Um, we were going into Romania um, expecting that we were going to be able to learn the language and the culture and um, and it was um, it was definitely a challenge but we got to a point that we could understand sermons on Sunday um, we went to Hungary and used Romanian sign language with the Hungarian deaf there and could understand them um, so I would say we were successful um, and and that was through the relationships at the deaf church. So um, this was our first experience in the deaf church. Um, and so obviously there was a lot of Romanian culture um, in that deaf church. And um, but we were just so overwhelmingly um, welcomed, and um, just the the church was wonderful, amazing. Um, and so we needed to um, we needed to learn a sign language and um, adapt into the deaf community, but we also needed to adapt to the Romanian um, culture and language. Um, and so that's one unique thing about um, being in Romania because most people don't have a background. In it's going to be a brand new language for just about everyone. Um, and this is something that's really important because um, now we're going to 
South America. Some people have already learned Spanish. We didn't, so this is still a new thing for us. Um, but there's a big difference when you're moving into a new culture and you don't know the language at all. Um, and so the, um, the ways that we had to learn how to adapt and live um, is something that we're going to have to continue to do as we're moving to another new culture. So this was a very safe environment for us to have all of these new experiences happening. Um, and so there are three teams there in Romania. There's the, um, the GSLT has their orientation and training. Um, and there's a number, there's a few members of the GSLT that live in Romania. Um, there's also the um, translation team that's working on the, the Romanian Sign Language Bible. Um, and then there's also Wycliffe Romania. Um, and so there's the three organizations that meet together every week. Um, and so there's a community there um, of people who um, when we had challenges or, or we had our baby there and so we needed to get the paperwork and um, pay our bills, they were all, um, they were all there to come around us and uh, be a part of that with us. Yeah, and it was, um, I mean, it's a really cool community. Um, like Carolyn said, I mean, there's three different teams, but we all relate to each other and work with each other and have a weekly prayer meeting together. Um, and the various members of the team, I mean, the, the deaf people on the translation team, they, you know, they're the ones that helped us adapt to the deaf church and introduced us at church. Um, and the Wycliffe Romania staff was incredibly helpful. Um, like Carolyn said, we had our first son, um, he was born in Romania, um, and navigating the paperwork of all of that was, um, it was a challenge. Um, and Ruben, the director of Wycliffe Romania, I mean, he spent two or three days with me going all over the city, um, just working on paperwork and getting things translated and trying to figure out which office we go to to what, um, which office we go to to do what. Um, and I mean, we are, we're very, very thankful um, for that community there, you know, to just help us through that, um, you know, adjustment to, I mean, living in a new culture and doing new things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and so another part of that was when we, we were learning a sign language. And so part of what we were learning is learning the process of how to learn a new sign language. Um, and so the relationships that are so important in that um, and the, the stories and um, we would go and we would prepare. We had a story to tell every time, every Sunday when we go to church and then we would practice it and we would tell it to everybody. And then slowly we would learn. I think it took us about six weeks till we felt like we weren't really drowning. Um, and then after that, I mean, eventually we got to a point where we could understand very well. Um, and there were a number of people in the church that um, were, became very close friends of ours. Um, and we're extremely excited to help us learn and, and teach us. And, um, but another thing about um, the language is that um, it helped us learn how to function because we didn't know it at all before we got there. We didn't know any Romanian. Um, we needed to learn how to go grocery shopping and pay our bills and, you know, um, talk to the person on the bus who came up to us and we don't know what they're saying and um, how to um, just do well in a culture where we don't know the language. Um, and then slowly we were working on um, learning the language, but that was a very important and learning experience for us um, to get comfortable with that because both of us have grown up in the U.S. where it's monolingual. Um, and so this was a this was a new experience for us and a very important one for us to have for being able to adapt in other places. Um, we also had the opportunity to visit other translation teams and see um, the different process that they had. So we were able to see the Romanian team, um, but then we could go to um, we went to the Hungarian project and then also the Colombian project and see the different ways that they're um, doing the translation. Um, and then also during that year, we were, we were able to explore what our future roles would be. Um, we didn't know going in. This was, okay, we're willing to do whatever needs to be done, but we didn't um, have an expectation. And so during that year, we were able to see the different roles that people do and what's needed um, and 
work on identifying what would be a good place for us to fit in that. Um, and so, yeah, we got to build a relationship with the translation team. We were able to sit in on a number of their consultant checks, um, and that really helped us be able to see what sort of um, challenges go into a sign language Bible and uh, the different things that they need to look at, even just the different programs that they use um, in their translation. Um, and we were able to ask them questions and they were able to explain things to us, how they were doing it, um, and the way that they would look at other translations, sign language translations, to um, see how to, how to do that. Um, so it was a, a very helpful thing for us to be able to build a relationship with that team and um, sort of walk alongside them as they were doing that. Um, and one of the other uh, really big benefits of the orientation and training program is that it, it provides experiential learning um, and that just takes a long time. Um, you know, going through things like culture shock or homesickness, missing holidays that you've, you know, always spent with your family. Um, that, that takes a while and that takes a while to process and eventually it gets to the point that um, that new culture feels like your home. Um, yeah, so it's, it's different when you've gone and visited a place for maybe a few weeks or a few months. Um, it's very different than living there. So how do I get groceries? How do I feed myself? How do I feed my family? How do I, um, all these little things that you don't really have to do when you're there for a short time. And so learning how to do those things and go through the processes of culture shock um, is something that you can't really rush through because you need to learn how to do it not by reading, but by actually experiencing it and seeing how you respond to those stresses. Yeah, and that's something, um, the intercultural communications course, um, I mentioned that as like the one thing that you have to do um, before going on the field with the Global Sign Languages team. Um, that course was really helpful, um, but, and that course, it, it teaches you, like, that course doesn't teach you how to live in a new culture. That course teaches you how to prepare to live in a new culture, but you still need to go to a different culture to actually learn how to live in a new culture. Um, and that's, that's the way that the uh, intercultural communications course and the orientation and training program work really well together, um, that the course teaches you how to prepare to be successful and then you can go to Romania and actually live that out um, and you can really experience being successful living in a new culture and Romania is a very safe place to do that. Um, I mean it's physically, emotionally, and spiritually it's a very safe place to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And, and, and I, um, I'm going to break in a second. Shauna has arrived, and so maybe um, Katie would like to stop interpreting and have a break. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Shauna. <laughs> Shauna, are you up and running? Let's see. Yeah, so if you need to scroll through to find Shauna, that she's, she's interpreting, and then... So Angela, if you could shake your head, did you, did you find Shauna yet? Um, if you can, you can scroll. Is she okay? Nope, hasn't found her yet. Still looking. Okay. Terry, can you help or somebody help Angela try to find? Um, yeah, I'm fine. I'm on a screen share. Okay. So it's, I scrolled over in the little bar that I have. So I, I've, I've, I've pinned Shauna's um, screen. Is everybody seeing that as being pinned or is that no. just me personally? No. Okay. No. So, yeah. So you yeah. have to pin her. Let's or Katie, can. can you tell her how Angela, maybe she sees you, how to. Because I, I, can, okay. I can see Shauna now. Because I'm screen Okay. I just pinned Shauna. Do you see my pin on your screen? It does. 
I think I, I think I, yeah. I think I figured out how to do it. It's a uh, spotlight. So I. Okay. Then we have some questions, but I'm re uh, to remind you, Dan and Carolyn, we're, this time is going fast. You probably have 15 minutes left, but there's some questions of what are the different roles there are. Maybe that's coming. Are there more roles? Certain roles needed more than others. Um, is it difficult to learn a sign language or a spoken language? Maybe you can read some of those. So I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, we're just going to talk a little bit more about the, um, the orientation and training program. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, and then we have a lot of those, um, a lot of those um, answers in, in that next part. So if there's anything that we don't clarify enough, feel free to ask more questions. Okay. A yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, let's see. I think we talked about a lot of these things. So, um, yeah. So, so during the, um, you could go to the next slide. Um, so during the um, program, um, we were that that probably would look different for different people. Um, and so we went to a couple different cities um, and we got experience traveling within the country. Um, and then um, as we visited other teams, we got experience um, traveling other places. Um, and so that, that year would probably look different for just about anybody. Um, we were six months in, we had a baby. And so um, we were sort of, making decisions based on, um, you know, where that time frame was going to end up. Um, and so I think we'll be, um, where is it? A lot of these things. So, um, go ahead. Um, yeah. So with, um, with the orientation and training program, like, like, like we've been saying, a lot of the time is, um, just learning how to live. And that is, a little bit different for everybody because everyone comes in with a different background. Um, so for us, it was learning how to navigate having a baby and then, you know, communicating with a pediatrician in a different language. Um, with other people, maybe it's, you know, learning how to cook because they haven't cooked at all um, or learning how to live as a single, even though you grew up in a family with nine children. So it's different for every person. Um, but those trials that you go through, they ultimately do end up being very beneficial. Um, and you, um, you, um, and, and you learn from that. Um, and, and an example, one of the things that we learned um, that um, helped us when we moved to Costa Rica, um, we learned that um, like for our family, whenever we move, finding food for the first couple weeks is you know for the first few days is a little bit challenging um so when you know we were trying to cook in costa rica with new ingredients and the first few meals that we made bombed um we weren't upset by that and we had a backup plan for you know doing dinner so you learn what are common problems that we have in new cultures and how can we prepare for that and be ready for that um, so that we're not completely thrown off whenever we do experience those new problems in a new culture. Yeah. So basically now that we're living in a different culture, we're seeing how um, just the experiential learning while being in Romania has helped us adapt to this new one. Um, so and then for the next slide. Um, so these are some questions that we're going to focus on um, just first briefly. And then if we need to go into more specific, specific detail, then we can, we can do that. Yeah, these are, these are pretty general questions that um, we tend to get asked a lot. Um, what's the sign language Bible look like? How many translations have scripture already? Um, how many translations are needed? Um, so on the next slide, um, the a sign language Bible it's in a video format um, and it is based on the Greek and Hebrew. Um, our consultants compare the drafts with the Greek and Hebrew to make sure that, I mean, the Bible, that the, the thing that we're publishing as a Bible is the Bible, it is the word of God. Um, and ultimately it is created by deaf for deaf. 
Um, and this is, you know, these Bibles are distributed on the internet, DVDs are through an app. Um, if you haven't seen a Death Bible, you can find it on YouTube or download the Death Bible app. So um, for the translation of scripture, so there's, um, we have a tremendous amount of need. Um, about this point, there are about 50 sign languages that have some scripture translated. Um, and right now, GSLT is working with 21 projects, um, but there's regularly receiving um, more requests for more communities. Um, and so this is a, um, it's a big task and we really need um, a lot more people to be able to do this. Um, and then, so we're at the point um, that there's so much work to be done. Um, there are currently, let me go to the next slide, there's currently about 400 sign languages that are identified that need a sign language Bible. Um, and there's still research being done, um, but there's estimating about um, up to a thousand different sign languages in the world, um, and they are completely different languages. And so um, each one needs a Bible. Um, so, yeah. Um, and another thing is the Global Sign Languages team is divided into four major regions. Um, so we talked a lot about the orientation and training program. That happens in Romania, which is, you know, the same geographical region as Eurasia. Um, and but through the orientation and training program, you learn about each of the different regions, how they're different, um, and you explore um, you explore what your future role on the team could be and where the Lord is calling you to. Um, for Carolyn and I, we didn't have a calling to a specific region. We just felt the Lord calling us to wherever there was the most need. Um, so for us, that was the Americas region. Um, so a lot of our learning in the program was directed towards that region. Um, the program is very flexible in that whatever you're interested in, wherever you feel that the Lord is calling you, um, that sort of the program, you know, the, the flexible program, you, you explore that area. Um, yeah, so we went to Hungary and we also went to Colombia. Um, but while we were during the program, they were looking for different projects for us to go. So we could have gone to, uh, we almost went to a project in the Philippines or um, we could have gone down to Tanzania or um, depending on, um, that was for us, it was depending on timing and when the, the teams were ready for us to come. But um, that was something that as we were looking at where our roles would be, um, where they would send us during that year was um, a part of that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then on the next slide, um, people already asked, what are some of the roles that are needed? Um, so these are some of the most critical positions that need to be filled right now. Um, consultants, project manager, managers, administrators, um, interpreters, grant writers. Um, but the truth is there's, there's a lot, there's a lot more. Um, I, I mean, basically anything, there's a lot of positions available. We need a lot of help. Um, and that's, I mean, what? I'm just going to, oh, you've got consultants on there. I was, I'm sorry. I, yeah. I meant consultants, but boy, that's a need that's preventing starting more projects at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From what I understand, there's projects that potentially could be starting, but we don't have any consultants to do them. So we can't accept those projects um, because we can't accept the project that we can't, I mean, support. Um, you know, we can't accept the project that we can't work with. Um, and like I said, with the orientation and training program, um, it's really great to be able to explore some of these potential roles. Um, my position is ultimately going to be an administration, um, but I was initially thinking that I would want to be a consultant. Um, so I began doing um, some work and, um, and I mean, towards exploring the role of a consultant. And when the Lord made it clear that no, actually, Dan, I want you to do administrative. Then my, you know, what I was doing in the orientation and training program switched, and I started doing more administrative works and shadowing 
uh, the regional director of Eurasia instead of shadowing one of the consultants um, that works in Eurasia. So um, the program really does a good job of helping you explore potential roles um, to see where you fit well, but ultimately to help you discern where the Lord is calling you to serve. Can you explain what a consultant does, a translation consultant? That's a question. And do you... Carrie, do you want to explain what a consultant does? Sure. I, I wondered if you were about ready to throw that my way. Um, yeah, <laughs> when you have a translation team who's working on drafting their, their translation into their sign language, um, but we need to make sure that that stays accurate to the, the original languages. We don't want things getting changed or wrong messages going out there. Um, a consultant will come alongside the team. They'll check the translation with the team to make sure the accuracy is still there. There's actually a four part, um, it, four different areas that we want to look at for, con for translations. One, it, and we talk about it being CANA, C-A-N-A. Um, you want it to be conceptually accurate. You want it to be, uh, or I'm sorry, clear, accurate is the A. Natural in whatever language it's going into. So in our case, we want natural signing in that sign language. And then you want it in a form that's acceptable to the people that it's being translated for. So consultants come alongside the team and help check in those areas. Besides translation consultants, there are also linguistic consultants. We are developing ethno arts consultants. Um, there's a number of types of consultants. We need exegetical support for teams. That's not a consulting role particularly, but it goes right alongside it. So hopefully that helps. Yeah. We have um, an awful lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> Albert's trying to, to uh, answer a lot of them, but uh, yeah, thank you, Robert. so hopefully people can stay longer. Go ahead, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. We're, and they're almost through their PowerPoint, so. Okay, good. Yeah, the last, the last major thing we were gonna say is um, just that our team, the Global Sign Languages team, we partner with several other organizations um, and we really try to work together with everyone that we can um, because our, our goal is to have the Bible be accessible to the deaf. Um, and that works best through partnering with other organizations um, and, you know, working together towards our mutual goal. Um, so, yeah, so um, that's, that's about all we have. So, yeah, we can go through and um, just try to answer the questions. Um, okay, so um, the translation consultants are mostly local deaf people say no they're usually from the global sign language team that come mm -hmm. in yeah typically the the translation team is made up of i think anywhere is four to eight or even more um local deaf um and then the consultant comes in once the team produces a draft then the consultant will come in and that's when the consultant checks the draft um for the four things that um, Carrie explains to make sure that it's clear, accurate, um, accurate according to, you know, exegetical Greek and Hebrew, um, natural and acceptable to the community. Um, so that's the primary thing that the mm -hmm. consultant does. And that's, that's not to say a deaf person couldn't do it, but mm -hmm. to be a consultant, um, there's different types of consultants. Um, they're, they need to have a master's. Or a um, master's equivalent. Or a master's equivalent. Um, and that would depend on the type of consulting that they're doing. So if it's exegetical consulting, um, that would be in the, sorry, biblical field. Um, and if it's linguistic, then it would be focused on linguistics. So there's other types of consultants as well. Um, and before you're a consultant, you work as a consultant in training. Um, and so you work directly underneath the consultant um, until you get to the point that you have your master's. Um, and there's a number of steps for levels of consultants. Um, and so um, we have a number of people who are working on becoming consultants. Um, they're consultants in training. Um, but there's a, there's a process for that. Terry, did you, see, did you see Kayla's question if we could go back to the slide that showed the partners in translation? Uh, okay, let me whoop, get my screen share up again. 
Yeah, and that's not an exhaustive list of our partners, but that is some of them. I think that it's most of the main ones, but I very well may have missed one or two or, you know. Hang on a second here. And I think you could, about interpreting, I think you need people that know ASL, don't you, that could maybe even work in the U.S. sometime when there's a need for interpreting? Is that right, Terry? Yes. Yeah. We have, we have um, interpreters. I, Sean is one of our um, volunteer interpreters. She's very, very, very part-time affiliated with our team. Um, and he lives in the U.S. and interprets for meetings sometimes that take place in Romania or other parts of the world. Sometimes we need people who can travel to another location if there's a conference going on, that type of thing. But yeah, we can definitely talk individually with people depending on what your situation is. I think I have the slide on partners back up. Yeah. And GSLT, we're not, you're not really involved with helping the deaf communities learn job-related skills, are you, that's outside of the translation? Your focus is Bible translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the focus is Bible translation, but also other language development activities. We just haven't had a lot of staff that, to be able to put into some of the other areas that we'd like to be working in more, things like helping with... Um, training of teachers, even training of interpreters in some countries where there is no interpreter training, and so deaf people don't have good access to that um, resource. Um, there's a lot of places, unfortunately, where schools for the deaf don't have teachers that can even sign, much less understand the linguistics of a sign language, that type of thing. There's a lot of other areas that we can also serve in if we have the staff and the capacity to do it. Um. To wrap it up, but we, we, we can stay on longer, but I, I just want to close the official meeting. You don't need any summers at UND to join GSLT um, to serve. You, you would join GSLT, go to the year in Romania, and work with them to figure out the best role. So you get the training for the role that you know you're going to do instead of get the training first, and then maybe um, you might do another role. So, but that's something that we can talk to you about. But the, what the GSLT does in translation is very similar to what our other translation programs are. Um, the translation consulting or exegetical helps and um, it's just working with the sign language and joining it looks a little different with the, your um, orientation and training. Um, Katie, thank you so much for stepping in and sign, you know, uh, what a blessing. Shauna, thanks for coming on board too. Uh, Terry, if you'd like to close us out and then people are free to leave or they can hang on and um, we'd be happy to dialogue more with you. Okay. Yeah, let me close this in prayer then. Father, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for Dan and Carolyn for the way that you called them to this work. Um, I thank you for the way that you're training them for the, the places that you're leading them to. We pray for them as they continue to study Spanish during this year, and then also as they transition at the end of the year and then begin to learn Colombian Sign Language and um, develop more into their future roles, Lord. We just pray that you will give them the grace, the peace, the guidance, step by step, just to follow you through that process. Um, I thank you for each person who joined this call tonight. I thank you for their interest, whatever that may be, Father. Um, whether it's just wanting more information, whether you're tapping them on the shoulder and asking them to consider coming to join our work. Um, Father, I just pray that you give wisdom as they consider the possibilities, as they consider what you desire for them in the future. And Lord, we just thank you for whatever that may be, for however you want to use each person that's involved in this call tonight. We thank you for the technology that makes all this possible as well. Um, and Lord, we just ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Um, I forgot to, I put a link to upcoming events. Um, if you, we have an Explore Bible Translation, which is a five-day event coming up at the end of the year, which is a great way to learn more about Wycliffe, and they do talk a little bit about sign language there. 
You do become a member of Woodcliffe before going to the year long. Well, um, and, yeah. oh, I training. Was gonna... training. Go ahead. Right. The ICC, the Intercultural Communications class, is usually you become a Wycliffe member before that, um, mm -hmm. before you go to that program. Yeah. Okay. okay. So feel free to drop off at any time if you want to stay on. Um, go ahead. And then maybe if uh, if people want to just unmute and ask questions, we can have a little bit more informal yeah. discussion. So I was curious, um, does going to UND, does that reduce the amount of time?